Hey, everybody, everybody, I got a guy on the show today. I am excited. Oh, man, y'all going to like this, bro. No, y'all going to love this. This guy is very, very knowledgeable of the history from all, a lot of facets, too. I guess he reads books when he sleep. He must be doing one of them audio things. He knows so much. He can talk on the plethora of things, a multitude of topics, with an opinion that he says that, man, I kind of appreciate. I kind of buy into what he was saying. I met him this the first time, but I saw him when I was uh, looking at a video broadcast uh, out of Selma, Alabama. He was the noted speaker on that program. He killed that situation. And I said, Ooh, I got to have him. And here we are. It's strong inspirations. I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm an ordinary guy trying to do something extraordinary by the people who come on my show like this gentleman. And uh, so hit the subscribe button on Strong Inspirations. It's free. I don't ask no information. All it lets me do and know is that you like me for what I am trying to do to intoxicate your mind with this Black history through the people who come on the show. Hit the like button on this video. That is a way of letting me and my guests know that you appreciate his research and his delivery of that research. How about that? And then hit the notifications bell for when the videos come up, you get a ding, a shock, a smoke signal, uh, your dog kicks you, uh, your, your kids grab you on your pants and tell you, hey, there's new information. There's something else we got to watch. And then tell somebody about our strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself. You're running around America and internationally and sharing some of these uh, videos and what you have learned and then don't tell nobody about it. That's not right. Come on now, let it flow. There, there, more people need to know of us and what we're doing and of this gentleman on the show today. Uh, as I had said earlier, I was in Selma. I was super excited. It, I, I drove down. I'm in Detroit and that was a nice ride. And I had times where I just thought as I looked out the window. And uh, once I got there, there were several people that I uh, met. There was one gentleman, he's on the show, Kurt Carrington. He was a foot soldier. He was one of them. He was 12 years old that was on that bridge on Bloody Sunday and got hit in his back and his back still hurts. There's another person that I, I interviewed that I met down there whose great-great-grandfather wrote the Jim Crow voting laws to stop Black people from voting. Oh, it's an interesting video. You got to watch that. I, 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 I got to say in that regard, he's not telling us he apologized. He said, I can't apologize, but I can come in my own way with a sense of love and respect for everybody. And I'll leave it at that. You got to watch that one. It's an interesting story to hear how racists think and how his great grandfather felt and thought about black people. Some he tries to kind of shoo away, but some other things, uh, the love and God took over him in some respects. Watch that one. Uh, did you see the one I did with the white guy whose great great grandfather was in the KKK in Elaine, Arkansas? He killed the guy. And the guy I interviewed wrote a book about it. And he says, after I found that out, I really could never speak to my grandfather again. And they were close. Watch that video. I got them from all over. I got those types and others. Now, a uh, couple housekeeping things uh, you might know. I'm a filmmaker, everybody. I did this documentary. And for those who are watching it and have watched it, thank you. It's streaming on Amazon. I stumbled across the facts that there were enslaved Black folks who went to college and enslaved Black folks who owned businesses. Did not know that. And I decided to put that in this documentary. This is going to make you a better business person, my friends, after watching this. I went one step further and I wrote the book on it. 
It has become America's number one black business history book. There is no other book as thorough, comprehensive, and easy to read as this. I add no commentary. I want the fact to stand on its own merit, and there are going to be a ton of them that you had never heard of. I give you the reference section so that you can look at and learn more. So come on now, everybody. Get you a copy of Black Business Book. Both of them are on Amazon. You can also go to my website, businessintheblack.net. Lastly, I know the guy, he's waiting and he's patient. He got the stuff. He got to tell it to you. But hold on just a second, my brother. Y'all, my guests, I want you to know that I'm speaking across the country. I'm coming out. I'm out of my shell, not just with this show, but there's a lot of things I'm doing here in Detroit, but I'm also going to be in Galveston, Texas. I'm speaking on Juneteenth, well, really on the 17th in regards to Juneteenth on that island. If you ain't doing that, come down and meet me. And then I'll be in uh, Mount Bayou, Mississippi on July 12th. And on July 19th, I'm in Lexington, Kentucky, and I got a bunch more of places I'm going. This thing has got to resonate among America, and I want to do more to help get it out. Now, you hear me use, and all that's on my website, businessintheblack.net. Now, you hear me use this term strong. Strong is my favorite word. Strong in my world means strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to the guest today. He's a strong soul, brother. Come on, man, introduce yourself. Let's get it on. Thank you for being on the show. Um, ple pleasure to be on with you. Um, how are you, African? Yeah. Um, my name is my name is Obi Aguna Jr. And I met um, Brother Anthony last month at um in the Jubilee uh, celebration in Selma. And he saw us at Wallace Community College as part of this African history um initiative that we have called um, Highway 80. Me, myself, I'm, I'm an organizer, just a servant of the people. But in terms of skill set, I'm a journalist. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching African history to children for 34 years. In my, my journalistic capacity, I have the distinction, the honor, of being the first. I was the first United States correspondent in the Zimbabwe's national newspaper in the 43-year history of the nation from 2008 to 2021. Um, All right, let me I'm stop you there. Let me stop you there. Let me, let me, uh, this is, excuse me one second. I mean, no disrespect. Uh, I got to ask you some questions, a little personal, so to speak. So my guests get to know you. Where were you born and raised? Okay, I was born in London. I lived there until I was three years old. I lived in Nigeria uh, for four years. And then after that, moved to the United States. So by the time I was eight years old, I had lived on three continents, um, Europe, oh, okay. Africa, mother to us all, and North America. Okay. So on my uh, father's side, I'm from Nigeria. On my mother's side, um, my mother is from Singapore. So, But I've spent most of my life in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. My elementary school, junior high school, high school, in college are all here in D.C. And um, I'm 54 years old. I'll be 55 in October. Yeah. And I've been an organizer for our people, front lines, serving okay. for our people since I was 19 years old. Let, let me ask you this. Do you remember any of uh, growing up in Africa? Yes. That's where my first um, formal schooling is. I definitely remember it. I moved between um, three places in Nigeria and what is called um, Anambra State, which is now Enugu State. My schooling was in Enugu, but I had family in Nsuka and in a village called Ozobolo. My family are what you call village people, which is the equivalent to if you live in North America, people who grew up in ru rural areas. So I had the opportunity to be in the urban centers, but every weekend we went to uh, our village home. So I had both foundations at my disposal. Okay. Let me ask you this. Uh, what uh, did you like living there? I was home. It was home. Um, it was very. Uh, Nigeria got its independence in 1960, so it was 16 years in. Um, my father was came there to be. He started the first writers workshop there, and um, he was the director of television in the eastern region of the nation. 
Mm. So um, went to public school. Yes, yeah, so, so I definitely mm. remember it. Um, yeah. It was English speaking in the school. So, but I was fluent in his mother tongue, Igbo. So yes, it's where it's where a lot began for me. I don't remember um, London at all, but I definitely remember um, Nigeria. Let me go back just a tad. Uh, is it where, where is there enslavement in your family? A plantation uh, from your mom or dad's so side? Both, or anything like both that? Both my parents um, are connected. Were met in England because of settler colonialism. The British conquered, invaded, and conquered Nigeria. And they invaded and conquered Singapore. And during that moment in history, there was no infrastructure for indigenous people to receive a higher education. So in most cases, those who achieved that plateau intellectually and academically had to go to the nation of their colonizer for their higher education. So that's how they met. My father was in London. Um, he went there to study electrical engineering. He ended up um, getting into writing. And he wrote the he wrote a book called Wind versus Polygamy in 1964, which ended up being London's submission to the first World and Arts Festival in Dakar, Senegal, which Kath, Kath, um, Catherine Dunham was one of the main organizers of that. So his play was there. My father went on to be a co-founder of the Black Panther Party in London and mm -hmm. an igniter of the Black Power Movement in London after Kwame Ture, formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, was invited there in 1967, one numerical year after him and Mukasa Dada, formerly known as Willie Ricks, reintroduced Black power. First uh, mentioned by Frederick Douglass, then mentioned by Richard Wright in a book in 1954, then mentioned by Adam Clayton Powell Jr., what he called audacious Black power. So Kwame and Mukasa then represented the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee Re reignited the concept amongst the 60s generation. And then of course, black power as a concept took on a life of its own. And Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana's first president wrote a pamphlet about it. Richard Wright's book in 1954 was dedicated to Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Adam Clayton Powell had a go of it and it found its way all to Australia. So the Panther finds its way to Australia finds its way to Jordan, finds its way to Syria, finds its way to Palestine, finds its way to India. And um, and then Steve Biko, um, looking at this, starts the Black Consciousness Movement and the Black Consciousness Movement of Azania and what is commonly referred to in South Africa today. So you have this blend. So yes, okay. um, my, so um, I represent the extension of our abduction. So okay. some of our ancestors were snatched away and abducted, but those who stayed were colonized and settler colonialism, as we know it, did not end until 1994, when what's called South Africa was the last nation to gain its flag independence. Oh, is that right? Okay, let me, let me, I'm gonna stay on you just a tad though. Okay, so you growing up with all this, it, 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 you hear him talking, you hear him writing, is yeah. it, is it mind blowing stuff to, to be a, uh, to growing up under, in that roof? Um, it, it just became second nature because it's all I knew. So um, when I was young, I was around some things and um, they were later explained to me when I got older so I could appreciate the authenticity of the moment. So he shared um, things in his life, about his life with me. So um, when I, I met Kwame Ture when I was seven years old, he came to where we were staying in Iowa, because my dad was in Iowa to participate in the internationally renowned writer's workshop. So I met him for the first time at seven years old. I marched with him in Washington, DC for African Liberation Day when I was nine years old. Um, so okay. I remember going to see Sekou Toure, Guinea's first president, talk at Howard University, um, hey. the first pres president of Zimbabwe, Mugabe, speak at uh, Howard when I was young. So I was around a lot of those things, but Honesty okay. compels me to say I didn't begin to appreciate those experiences so I was older. And okay. when I was older, um, I we talked you. about those things, Contract, com comparing and contrasting our experiences, what it was like for me to grow up organizing in North America in comparison to what it was like for him to grow up in Britain. And at the time, I'm finding out from him that the time that the Black Power Movement was ignited in Britain, Grenada's first prime minister 
revolutionary prime minister, Maurice Bishop, he was there at the same time studying law. Fela Kuti was there studying music. Um, I, mean, I gotta stop you. I gotta stop you. I gotta stop you right there. I, I, I want to stay on you just a tad bit moment. So you growing up, okay. this, did 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 he did he kind of force this on you, or did you accept no. it? The total, the total opposite. One of the things that I love so much about my parents, and this is the approach that we take to working with the young people that we work with. Um, if there's a thinner line than the line between love and hate, it's the line between in imposition and exposure. We want to expose African children at home and abroad to everything under the sun, but force nothing on them. So nothing was forced on me. As a matter of fact, what made me begin to circle back and look at the things I had the privilege to be exposed to, I almost lost my life at 15 years old in a fight in the neighborhood. I got stabbed up pretty bad trying to break up a fight. And then um, I began to reflect on all the seeds that were dropped at drop my... In okay, my hold life. on. Let me stop right all there. All the things that I was shared, that were shared with me. So when you... So growing up, did you grow up around white people? Did you know white people? Did no, you learn, man, Did you I hate white in, people? I did you appreciate in, white people? DC, I grew up in D.C. at the height of the crack cocaine and PCP era, man, in the 1980s. Oh, no. I grew up. I grew up in it, as they say. Did, so, did he um, did, did he did he like white people? Your father? Mm, he understood our historical relationship to colonialism, to captivity, to every ounce of oppression that we'd endured at home in Africa and abroad in the diaspora. So, on an individual level, he had no problem with them. But it's always about looking at our relationship to the political systems that dominate our lives politically, economically, and culturally. Okay, let me so, ask you this. No, no, no. So that, that's how he approached life, and that's what was that's how my mother approached life, and that's how um, things were instilled in me. So he taught me who John Brown was. He taught me about the Irish, who the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey said, Africa for the Africans, Ireland for the Irish. And he told me that his favorite white man was Fidel Castro, Comandante Fidel Castro. The same Fidel Castro that the Panthers loved, the same Comandante Fidel Castro that SNCC loved, the same Fidel Castro that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan loves and respects, the same Fidel Castro that Nelson Man Madiba Nelson Mandela loves and respects, that Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah loved and respected, that Akme Sekou Toure loved and respected, that Africans all over the world love and respect, because even though he is has a European makeup, He's with no question a revolutionary. So okay. we look at human beings based on that. And that's okay. a testament to our nationalism. Okay. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you. I, I mean, no disrespect. Okay. So now he's he's talking about, and you're hearing all these things that white people have done to black folks all this time throughout, mm -hmm. throughout our, our civilization. Why do we forgive them? Why do, uh, is it, if that's what we do, why do we... Uh, 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 respect them or or have some attitude other than dismay against them? Um, Because, um, well, I, I'm only speaking at it in the context of resistance. I'm not talking about individual relationships. We fight them to liberate ourselves from a political system. So in Africa, it wasn't about um, if you were in Ghana or Nigeria or Zimbabwe or Kenya. It wasn't about your one-on-one -on -one relationships with the British. It was about liberating yourself from colonial rule, British colonialism in that instance. For someone in Angola or Mozambique or Guinea-Bissau or Brazil for that matter, um, whether you could sit down and have ice cream or watch television with somebody Portuguese, that was irrelevant. What was primary was liberating yourself from Portuguese colonialism. So when you're in pursuit of liberation for your people to control your land, to control your economy, to control your history, to control your culture. You don't focus on individual relationships. You focus on if you have the power to be the master of your people's destiny. And when you when that is your focus, that means that the African fighting spirit guides you. Okay. So individual relationships are not our focus. What our focus is, is our liberation. Okay, but I, that leads to- system. Yeah. And, any, and anyone who defends the system, apologizes for the system, celebrates the system that is only intact 
at the expense of your people's suffering, at the expense of your people's dehumanization, that's what you deal with. Okay, so that leads to this. And I, I, you're on the right point. I, I'm just getting to something here. Okay, just like I met that white guy whose great grandfather did what he did. Do mm -hmm. and, and under the under what you speak about, is it our attitude to dethrone white people or to and, and or to make black people respect ourselves more and understand our independence to, to uh, peace of mind? You you follow what I'm asking un, there? Un, under, understand our relationship to the system that we live under. Understand our in the context of the historical moment that we live under. If I live in North, I live in North America right now. So when I talk to Africans in North America, my focus is you are 12 percent of the population, but you're 43 percent of the homeless. Your relationship to the prison industrial complex is a ruthless one. Your relationship to the blue collar crime wave is a ruthless one. The Democrats and Republicans have mercilessly manipulated you. So your relationship to either party is you're fighting to smash both of those parties. Your relationship to the FBI, your relationship to the CIA, your relationship to the military, your relationship to US imperialism is you are at their mercy and history obligates you to organize your people and fight them till you are liberated from them. And to join ties with your people in South America, Central America, Latin America, the Caribbean, all the way to Canada, the true definition of America, who were all dropped off by captivity vessels. The same reason you're in Detroit is the same reason you're in Nicaragua, the same reason you're in Jamaica, the same reason you're in Puerto Rico, the same reason you're in Panama. And we all unite around that principle. And then, of course, the one place we all have in common is Mother Africa. We all mm. don't have North America in common. All right. We all, all right. don't have Brazil in common. We yeah. all don't have India in common. We all don't have Australia, where we've been for 80,000 years in common, but the one place we have is Africa. So okay. we're going to follow We're going to follow the last line of lift every voice and sing, which they don't let us sing, which is to be true to our God and true to our native land. That's so we right. weren't with James Weldon right. Johnson when he wrote that in, in 1923, but we know our native land is not Jamestown. We know right. our native land is in Detroit. We All know right. our native is in D.C. But if we wage resistance and let the African fighting spirit guide us in these places, we'll connect with who we're supposed to connect with, when we're supposed to connect with them, and how we're supposed to connect. Okay, with them. I got two questions. Two, uh, they, they 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 coincide. It is when was the best time for Black people in our history? Was it the Moors? Mm, I'm. A, I look at I look at our lives in the context of our resistance. So anytime we've had significant victories, that was good. But I'll do that two ways. If you ask me that as someone, let's say I was born in this country and I accepted the amputated narrative of the African experience, and I had a narrative that cuts me off from Africans and the rest of the Americas, Africans and the rest of the diaspora, and certainly in the to, to Mother Africa. All I have to do all I have at my disposal is a cycle of oppression. So I have to ask myself, was it worse when I was in shackles or was it worse when I was in handcuffs? Because handcuffs are an extension of shackles. Pauli Murray went to jail for refusing to give up her seat on a bus in Virginia in 1940. 15 years later, Rosa Parks did the same thing. A few months before her, Claudette Colvin did the same thing. Joanne Robinson did the same thing. But the four of those great sisters, they went to jail for something that Ida B. Wells went to jail for in the, eight, in the 1870s. And at that time, there was a legislation in place that they did away with that said there could be no discrimination against public in, in public places. So they went to jail for something that Ida B. Wells went to jail for in the 1870s. I got you. Lyndon Johnson, because of the blood that SNCC shed, that SCLC shed, that CORE shed, you got a voting rights bill in 65 for something you already had in 1866, which ushered in the Reconstruction period. That's right. So the That's only right. thing we have to choose from, which is the narrative that they try to force on us, which is a narrative rooted in victimization, is when were things worse? Things have never been good, but when were things worse? 
And the only way to counter that is to focus on the resistance, to show people the same way you fought on the plantation is the same way you fought during the sharecropping era, the same way you fought when, when you came up with the Harlem Renaissance. That was an act of resistance. When the, when the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey built the mass movement, when the NAACP was created, when we fought in the courts, when we, when we protested in the streets, then we went to urban rebellions and burnt down 289 cities in a three-year period. So any progress we've made, it's because of our bloodshed and individuals who are beneficiaries of that bloodshed, but don't consider that bloodshed the root of their success, yeah, the I reason for their individual success. So if but, you ask me that here, this is what I'm going to say. If right. you ask me that in Africa, I'm going. Um, when Dr. King was in Birmingham in jail, he said he was looking to the anti-colonial movement in Africa, where between 1957 and 1960, 35 nations got their independence from colonial rule, the most rapid swing towards peace and progress in the history of the modern world. So some of them fought, took up arms to fight. In Algeria, we took up arms. In Kenya, we took up arms. But in Ghana, we used positive action which was equivalent to civil disobedience in this country. In Guinea, that's how they liberated themselves. In the Congo, that's how they, they liberated themselves. So the so if I'm looking at my history, especially in modern time, through the scope of my resistance, how I wage resistance, how successful I was, what were the setbacks, what were my strengths, what were my weaknesses, this is how we must look at history moving forward. We okay. must make I love it. the cornerstone of our narrative. That's all, all we right. need to do. But, but let me ask you, was, was, the Moors, uh, was the Moors the time that Black people were on top? We, we, when people look at the Moors and people look at us in antiquity, you see examples of the Moors moving all around the world, taking control of the world. You see the dynasties that people have a tendency to focus on. This is why I've asked the world-renowned uh, chemitologist, Dr. Anthony Browder, who's one of our partners with the work in Selma, where I met you. I've been begging that brother for the last 14 years. Shout out to Tony Browder and his wonderful daughter, Atlantis. I've been begging the brother for the last 14 years for him and I to do a seminar for young people called Africa Yesterday, Africa Today, and Africa Tomorrow. So we can see how our history millions of years ago is connected to what happened 15 minutes ago. Because what we don't wanna happen moving forward is when people look at the work of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, which John Henry Clark established in the 1970s. We, and he did, the, for many people who don't know, those um, great kings and queens of Africa segments in Ebony, which, Am which Amhazer Bush paid for, he wrote those layouts focusing on each of those dynasties. Mm. Dr. Mm. Clark did that. Mm. But what happened was the residual effect of that is how people where it was positive from the vantage point that you we have no business starting our history in chains in, in Jamestown. So you take me to Timbuktu, you take me to Songhai, you take me to the Moors, but you affirm this narrative that all of that is part of my past. And what that does is it does not equip me to deal with the problems that we face presently. Mm. And as we're having this conversation, according to Forbes magazine, there are about 3,000 billionaires. At, and at the same time, there are 709 million people that live on $1.90 a day or less. Mm. And 70% of them live on the African continent. The United Nations has a category they call extremely poor nations. 22 of them are in Africa. The only ones that aren't in Africa are Haiti, which is an extension of Africa, mm -hmm. the Solomon Islands, which is an extension of Africa, and Afghanistan. So as Kwame Ture used to teach us, Africans have the richest continent in the world at their disposal, but we're the poorest people in the world. And the U.S.-born African, commonly referred to as an African-American, is supposed to rest on the laurel that you're the most comfortable poor person on this planet. But what we're trying to do is end poverty and reclaim what belongs to us so we can give our people the basic necessities that they need. Mm -hmm. Every wow. African should have clean water. Every African should have quality housing, quality health care, quality education. 
And we can't make that happen until we take control of that continent, which will give us the power to have those resources at, the disposal, okay. at our disposal uh -oh. and the proper mentality and orientation to make that happen. Because some okay. of us will take the wealth of Africa and keep it for ourselves. We know let that. Me, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you. Okay, I want to, I want, I, I, I'm, I'm going on a high note. That's what I want to do. As if I'm looking at this, and I know you know these uh, the, the, this information, so to speak. On the high note, I, again, I go back to that. The Moors dynasty is when black people out of Africa ruled the world, or uh, ruled parts of it. Is that correct? Yeah. I understand. All right. No, I know who they are. Okay, and I'm how long did that ruling last? Hmm. It la it, la it lasted for a minute. The exact number, but this is what yeah. I'm saying to you. They represent an era in our history where you would call that the feudal era. And feudalism as a concept is when people are aggressively in pursuit of wealth and domination. So capitalism, as we know it today, finds its roots in feudalism. This is what Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah taught us. We, on the other hand, those of us who believe that the world is better off if the planet is socialist, socialism finds its roots in communalism in Africa. So when people celebrate Mansa Musa as the richest man in the world, he had $400 billion. This is what they say he was worth, right? If he had $400 billion, what do you think the everyday Malian had? But it, it's no coincidence that they pump Mansa Musa on us, but most people don't even know who Modiba Keita is. Modibo Keita didn't die till 1977 in prison. He was the leader of the revolution in Mali. And he set Mali up. It was strong and the people benefited. And the current government in Mali that has reclaimed power, kicked the French out of Mali, wants to break all ties with the French. They are going back studying his government and trying to reinstitute what he had from the 1960s. He was overthrown by the CIA in 1968 right. and died in prison since 1967. So what yeah. I, I'm, we should study it all. Yeah, but yeah, I got you. Our, our, our motivation are the revolutionary forces who fought to make sure that Africans benefit from the wealth. All of us benefit from the wealth. Right. All of us must have the gold. The diamonds must be for, for the benefit of everyone. The uranium must be for the benefit of everyone. Let, if not, we need to leave it in the ground. Let me ask you this question. People. Let me ask you this question. When? Okay. Well, uh, how about this one? When? When? Uh, we talked a little bit about the Moors and the domination of Moors. There are other uh, uh, countries that uh, we should be extremely proud of for their dominant for their kicking out of the oppressor and the colonizer. Mm -hmm. And I would tend to think, and you can chime in. Haiti should be one of those on the top of the list. I, oh, and there goodness. are others, we right? Can't, we can't talk about, we cannot talk about um, our fight against captivity and not begin it with Haiti. That's but right. When you do that, you have to maintain it because how do we go from Makandal? How do we go from um, Cecile Fatima? How do we go from Desalines to Papa Doc and Baby Doc? who mortgaged everything the revolution accomplished and put Haiti back in the, in the pocket of France. And our people in Haiti are still suffering from that today. That's so right. what happens is when we gain our independence, we have to maintain it. So when we maintain it, Brother Anthony, mm -hmm. it's very important that maintaining independence is harder than attaining independence. And whether we look at the Caribbean, whether we look at Africa, this is what happened. When we have these mag when we have these magnanimous victories, if we aren't careful, we end up reversing the trend yeah, of yeah, all yeah. the positive gains that we had. Get, give so, me another. Of course, uh, Haiti, Haiti was important then. Yeah. Give me another victory. Give me another victory. Okay. That a country did, Ghana a nation under, did. Ghana, Ghana under Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah from 1957 to 1966. He free education for the people, free health care for the people, 68 factories built in a nine-year period, a tire factory, a manganese factory, a cocoa factory, a bicycle factory, the first hydroelectrical dam on African soil. 
The six months that Patrice Lumumba was in the Congo, the four years that Thomas Sankara presided over Burkina Faso, the 35 years that Akhmed Sekoutoure presided over Guinea, even though Guinea won their independence through demonstrations and strikes and boycotts, the first thing he instituted, he's the only African leader to ever do this, was the people's militia. Every child, woman, and man that was physically able went through intense military training because he said the job of defending a nation should not be um, re confined to the soldiers. The people are the army. And then he's the first leader to tell our story to the world in the form of a ballet. And if you've ever seen the Guinean ballet, people rank it over the Russian ballet, the Chinese ballet, and the Cuban ballet. This right, is I what love he it. did. I love it. What, what about I Liberia? Say, I would say well, Eritrea. It... I would say Eritrea. That is 33 okay. years old. It's the only nation in Africa right now that has free education and free health care for the people. I would I would say um, Namibia. But so we have a handful of examples that we can show. But one of the things that's consistent with them is many of them weren't able to consolidate power because the enemy went after them. I would add the Cuban revolution to that because okay. Cuba is 60 percent African and Cuba has the highest literacy rate in the world, the lowest infant mortality rate in the world, the highest doctor per capita of places that were colonized and invaded. I love it. I love they it. were able during the corona pandemic to send 57 brigades to 40 nations. They are on the verge of being the first nation in the world to cure cancer. They have developed a vaccination for diabetes type two victims that prevents the amputation of limbs. They are working, they've worked in conjunction with the Venezuelan government on a project called Operation Miracle, where they have restored eyesight to people who had gone blind or were on the verge of going permanently blind. Hundreds and thousands of people have been beneficiaries of that treatment. So I would definitely use them as an example. So mm -hmm. we have these examples, but what happens is the enemies of progress, the enemies of peace, the enemies of truth do everything they can to try to manipulate this information or conceal this information. What right. Zimbabwe did with their land reclamation program, where they took, reclaimed 4,000 land for 350,000 Zimbabwean families, where the average family is six people from 4,500 commercial farmers of European ancestry who had that land they were beneficiaries of the British and South African company invading Zimbabwe in 1890. And even though Zimbabwe was 20 years into independence, they still had access to that land. But the Zimbabwean people and the government finally made that wrong a right, reclaimed what was ours. I love so it. These are the countless examples that we have in modern times that we need to be connected to, that we need to be working with so that we can move forward as a people. And I that way- even if that means it put being on a collision course with the Democrats and Republicans who still you. feel they have the right to define for us who to hate and who to love on this planet. Now, now, how, how did, uh, what do you think happened that how white people got to be, and I, I don't know of another word to put it, but in charge? In, in power? How, oh, they, they, in power. They, how, how did they, they come they, up they like that? They organize themselves to do it. They're just organized. The only difference between the colonialists and the imperialists and you and me is they're better organized than us. But when we get organized, we have, have had many victories. We just have to maintain that level of organization. Because, because uh, civilization we, every, started every in Africa. We organize, huh? Civilization started in Africa. So then the, the, yeah. the people leave Africa and then they they migrating all over the world and then they go to they go to Europe. And then they get to Europe, and then those people over there get to thinking, oh, man, well, now that we are, even though we're descendants of Africans, we're going to go back over there, and we're going to take over that continent. We, and we're going to be vicious but in one, our but attempt. They came, but they came in organization. The Cecil Rhodes didn't come by himself. He came with the British South African Company. They came organized. They organized a conference because they were at war with each other over who would control us. This is a very consistent part of colonialist history. The French and Spanish fought over who would control Haiti. The Spanish in the United States fought over Cuba. 
the British and the Italians fought over Somalia, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. So, right. so they had a conference in Berlin, in West Germany, That's right. and they sat there for four months together, and they made the peace, and they amicably divided our sacred land over what would be under their control. So they understood the their, they re, they realized that their organizational endeavors could be sabotaged by greed. So they went behind closed doors and they rectified that situation. And we on the same hand, when we liberated ourselves, and Krumah did not liberate Ghana, the Convention People's Party did. Sekou Toure did not liberate Guinea, the Democratic Party of Guinea did. Emil Cabral did not liberate Guinea-Bissau, the Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde did. Dr. King didn't march in Birmingham by himself, he marched with the Southern Christian That's Leadership right. Conference. That's right. Dr. What, what, King didn't. He, yeah, Dr. King didn't. Um, and Rosa Parks were part of the Montgomery Improvement Association. That's right. That's what right. we have to do moving forward, Brother Anthony and listeners, don't focus on the individuals in isolation from the organizations they're part of, and don't pay attention to their powerful words separately from their labor and their deeds. We can pick any historical figure you want right now. You 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 sound like a very well informed brother. You, you could probably give me 20 Martin Luther King quotes right now off the top of your head. But if I ask you specific details about the Montgomery Improvement Association, specific details about Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, specific details about the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, you probably couldn't tell me. Yeah, yeah, du Bois, sure. you could do the same thing. But if I ask about the Niagara Movement, if I ask about the Peace Information Center, if I ask about um, his sociological studies in Clark, Atlanta, you can't tell me. So the shift we must make in this decolonization process, we must teach about their labor, we must teach about their service, so people are attracted to the service. And I what that you. will do is we will stop immortalizing our heroes. The reason we don't make more contributions to our history is because we're intimidated of our history. For example, I'm 54 years old, so just numerically, as far as the calendar, I'm supposed to do more than Malcolm and Dr. King because I've lived 15 years longer. That does not mean I'll be as popular as them. That does not mean I'll be revered like them, but I can still make quality contributions because most of our significant contributors, we don't even acknowledge their contributions till they're long gone anyway. We're still learning about Du Bois' work. We're still yeah. learning about the Honorable Marcus Garvey's work. As a matter of fact, we look at, and I gotta say this to you because you're right there in Detroit. We don't give the most honorable Elijah Muhammad credit for very little of his work. I would argue the reason we're vegan today, those of us who've made that choice, is because he told our grandparents to put down the spare rib and pork chops. Yeah, that's the right. reason we have African names as long as our arms and legs is because he told us to take that X and give the plantation owner back that name. That's right. I laugh every time people bring up Muhammad Ali and make it seem like he just woke up one day and said that he ain't going to Vietnam. He didn't go to Vietnam because he could look at the most honorable Elijah Muhammad as a as a reference point because he went to jail for five years for refusing to go to World War II. So while others were pacifists and just talking about the morals of the war, he said, put the cuffs on me. I don't fight for the devil. Praise yeah. be to Allah. And he did let, five years. Let, let me ask so you this. We begin to teach more about the labor, more people will be attracted to the labor more people will become involved in the labor. Let me ask. Let me ask you this: When, uh, why, why are, are black people like we are then? Why, why did we let them come in Africa and take over? Why do we let them well, treat Haiti the way they do, and so on and so forth? One, we were fighting amongst each other, not in an uncivilized way. Those of us who wanted to maintain a communal society where we shared Africa's wealth. We were at war with the dynasties who wanted to take over the wealth. So we were fighting and they came in and exploited our differences. See, the one thing about the one thing about us that we have to learn, and this brother Malcolm was right in the 1960s when he gave the speech in Detroit, his famous message of the grassroots speech. He said we must submerge our differences. In 1963, that strategically made sense. But what happened as time went on, we don't understand the differences anymore. 
We need to address the differences for the purpose of having a qualitative comprehension of the differences so the enemy cannot manipulate the differences. Mm -hmm. The NAA, I must know what my disagreement is with the NAACP, but for the purpose of knowing what I can work with them on. I must know what my differences are with the National Council of Negro Women for the purpose of knowing what I can work with them on. So while I can highlight and contextualize the differences, I should also be identifying the things that we can work on together. And this is why history obligates us, and this requires patience, this requires discipline, this requires scrutiny. Find the issues that we can all work on, regardless of where we fall in the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I sincerely I believe right now that that issue, more than any other issue right now, is rallying around Cuba. Let me tell you why. All these puppet African governments that make us sick to our stomach, they vote against that blockade that the U.S. imposed on Cuba that's 61 years old now. Every year at the U.N., they vote against that. I've seen the National Council of Negro Women reach out to Cuba. I've seen the National Action Network, Rainbow Coalition, Nation of Islam, all African People's Revolutionary Party reach out to Cuba. As a matter of fact, Right now, we can use your show as a plat as a vehicle for this. If you know some young people who have aspirations to be doctors that are frustrated because the opportunities are dried up in the United States, you need to learn about the Latin American School of Medical Sciences in Cuba. You can become a recipient of a $250,000 scholarship. You just have to go to school here and take physics, take chemistry, take biology, and conversational Spanish. You can do this by your sophomore year. And if you qualify, you can go to Cuba and learn for seven years. But you sign an agreement that you're going to come back to Southside Chicago, South Bronx, New York, Southeast D.C., South Central Los Angeles, Huntsville, Alabama, Uniontown, mm. Alabama, the dirt poor places in North America, and apply your trade. So we you. think that you. we think that every or all our organizations should come together and make a commitment that we're going to because when Comandante Fidel Castro made that agreement with the Black Caucus 24 years ago, he said he would give away 500 scholarships to our children a year. Brother Anthony, in 24 years, only 200 kids have gone through that program. We should come together and we should identify 500 kids a year that want to go to medical school. You mean to tell me we're not willing to do that? Because I don't know about you, when I go through all the cemeteries in our community, the people are there because of diabetes. The people are there because of heart attacks. The people are there because of strokes. The people are there because of cancer. The people are there because of these other ailments that categorically are called non-communicable diseases. And 14 years ago at the United Nations, I was there when the World Health Organization met with all the African head of states. And they said from 2010 to 2038, 57 million people will die on earth from non-communicable diseases. Once again, strokes, diabetes, heart attacks, high blood pressure, hypertension. Those diseases have now surpassed AIDS, malaria, and mm -hmm. cholera as the number one killer of the human being. So our community needs to be equipped. The reason that so many, look at the casualties from the corona pandemic. They were people with bad hearts, mm, unhealthy. That's right, things. that's right. You see what I'm, so, so right. we have to prepare for that. So if we rally around a nation like Cuba, that is 60% African, we will begin to, and we will look at how they educate themselves. We will look at how they empower the doctors. We will feed off that energy. And we will go back because you and I were in Alabama together. Alabama has 297 prisons in comparison to 26 hospitals or clinics. That's unacceptable. In comparison to 60 colleges, that's unacceptable. And the governor of Alabama is building two more. Brother Anthony and listeners, there are more people in prison in Alabama than China or India the nations on earth with the two largest populations. How can one state in North America have more people in prison than the two largest nations on earth? What, 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 let me ask problem. you this. Let me ask you, what do white people want to do with us? 
They want us to play basketball, football, make the sports good. They like some of our intellect. They 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 want us to take comfort in being convenient patriots, good nephews and nieces to Uncle Sam. Just cap all our capitulation and surrender, no resistance at all. So no matter it, as long and as long as more and it, even though we are homeless, even though gentrification, rare life Lego, as we like to call it, continues to be on the rise, even though the blue collar crimes in our community are on the rise, the poverty is on the rise. We are underemployed as well as in, unemployed. And the only thing they'll look you straight in the face and say, and the imperialist and the capitalist will look you in the face and say, as well as better than living anywhere else, look at the Caribbean, look at Latin America, but not telling you that the pain and suffering that those people experience is because of their policies to plunder, rape, and dominate those places as well. So yeah, you're really right. in the same boat. So, but, so they just want you in a frame of mind where you capitulate, while you while you bow down, while you submit, they want to make sure you have no ounce of resistance left. But human nature is not so. The more oppressed you are, you will resist. But if they can convince you that you're no longer oppressed, then you won't wage resistance. But the resistance is too obvious and too blatant. The only thing is to take a look at the work we're doing in these all these areas. As a matter of fact, in the state of Alabama, where we came from, you were there in the seminar. The legislators in Alabama are now saying they don't want the history taught accurately because it will lead to the exacerbation of tension between us and others external to our culture. But guess what? It's the, it's the inevitable. Because when you teach about our history, you have to, there are certain things you can't avoid. And there are certain lies that you will uncover. That's they right. told us that James Earl Ray killed, doc, assassinated Dr. King. We know it was the FBI and CIA. They told us the Nation of Islam assassinated Malcolm X. We know it was the FBI and CIA. So what that does is it prepares us for a collision with the FBI and CIA. We know that the CIA put coke, crack cocaine in Los Angeles that was spread all over the country for the purpose of generating more capital to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. A, a nation in Central America with the largest African population who had been under a U.S. installed regime, one family controlled the destiny of Nicaragua with the Somoza family for 70 years. No different than Baby Doc and Papa Doc in Haiti. No different than Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. All places where Africans call home because we were taken away from our original home. So let, me, let me ask, let me, let me, let me ask you this. Learn. Yeah, we're going uh, to point. And you're going to come together. When, you're on point. When does when does God step in? God already stepped in. He That's saved us from our, He saved our us first, from destruction. Our first, our first organized resistance is what the Free African Reci Society in 1794. Richard Allen and Absalom Jones were what preachers. Nat Turner was a preacher. Denmark Vesey was a preacher. Gabriel Prosser was a preacher. Dr. King, Fred Shuttleworth, Gardner Taylor, Wyatt T. Walker said, man, it ain't enough to preach the good word on Sunday. We need to be in the streets with the people. Everywhere we wage resistance, the church has been right there. What we call liberation theology, what we call the social gospel, that will become the norm. It has to become the norm. We, t we say this all the time to our sisters and brothers in the club. If, if Jesus sends Dr. King back as his proxy and says, Martin, shut down all the churches that aren't using, that don't embrace the social gospel and liberation theology, how many will be left open? But the few are open that will stay. They've been consistent. And it's very important to point that out because the enemy wants you to think that nobody's doing anything. Three and a half years ago, Malawi, Mozambique, and uh, uh, Zimbabwe were hit by a cyclone. And for people who don't know what that is, that's a mudstorm. And you can drown in mud the way you drown in water, which people say is more horrific. And the mud was so high that people in those places had to sit on the roofs of their home, could not move, could not eat, could not sleep, nothing. And we reached out to 
um, Minister Farrakhan's right hand man in D.C., the great liberation theo theologian, the Honorable Willie Wilson of Union Temple Baptist Church. And we raised $5,000 in 45 minutes. Many people may not understand the significance of that. If every church in North America that Africans run in control raised $5,000 a month and gave it towards the humanitarian crisis on the African continent, where I said they are 409 million people living on a dollar and 90 cents a day. We could run Bill Gates out of Africa. We could run George Bush out of Africa, who now has the largest highway in Ghana named after him, who now his foundation has broken the record for testing women for breast and cervical cancer. So now our people are calling him a savior. So in all his crimes against Africa, all his father's crimes against Africa have been washed away. At least that's what they'd like you to think. So what we did that day, Brother Anthony, we gave people a model and a practical example. If, our church, if the National Baptist Convention would dare, if the United Methodist Convention would dare, if the Africans in the Catholic Church would dare, we could come together and run the United States Agency for International Development out of Africa, all the imperialist outlets who are nothing but the extension of the intelligence agencies of the U.S. government who pretend to be in Africa on humanitarian grounds. But they have demonstrated that they are an extension of the intelligence agencies. So we can do that. But so we gave people a practical example they can look at. And if they dare to walk that road, if they dare to walk that path, if they dare to get in pursuit of that plateau, it is achievable. Uh, as we almost come to a close, I want to I want to uh, switch just a bit. How you get to be the knowing all them dates and stuff, man? You rattle them off so well. I know you've been said you've been doing it a bunch study, of years, but how study, does you know study, how do you get study that? Service, man? Man, study and service, study and service, study and service. Because um, the perception is that organizers don't study. No, 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 no. We're the most studied because we have to be. Because if we're talking about organizing our people. If I'm going to work with Africans in the church, I got to know the Bible. If I got to, if I want to work with Africans who are Muslim, I got to know the Quran. If I want to work with Africans who are journalists, I got to know the history of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. If I'm going to work with the NAACP, I got to know their history. If I'm going to work with the Nation of Islam, where I had the honor of teaching at Muhammad University of Islam for six years, even though I'm not a member of the Nation of Islam, but they knew the pedigree, I have to know it. Okay, so what when do you do? You, you, every night, got established. We have yeah. to study the history of the theater movement in this country. Yeah, so every, let me ask you, so every work, night you, you read a book, the work of those who came before you. Can I ask you, every night you read a book? Is that what you, is that, is that how you do it? You wake when up, I, I mean, because I, I have, I have, I have no, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is this if there's somebody watching this to say, I kind of want to be like this guy, I want to be that knowledgeable, what would you suggest they do? They got to join the organization working for their people, because when you organize, one of the most essential aspects of organizational discipline is study. Study. I don't read. I study. Christians shouldn't read the Bible. They should study it. Muslims shouldn't read the Quran. They should study it. Jews shouldn't read the Torah. They should study it. A revolutionary should, doesn't read about revolution. They study it because what you study is what you apply. And the best way to show confidence in an idea that you articulate is the is the uh, ability to execute, to perfection. You. Once you I, do that, I, I, so, have no, you no, written no, no. a book? So it's a harmonious balance between theory and practice. Have, have you well, written a book? Before, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said, "Practice without thought is blind. Thought without action is empty." We balance both. The problem is that we have many people today. Who are just trying to build a brand at the expense of our movement and they don't respect labor and they don't respect service that's why there's such a disparity between the commentary and the activity so we want to make sure that they're both on equal planes you do what you talk about if you don't do it don't talk about it. or become yeah. the support system for those who are doing it. and Have don't you written pretend a book? like you're doing so and don't pretend like you're doing what you what you say you're doing don't talk about don't give yourself a label about Pan-Africanism, but you're not fighting, and you live in the United States, but you're not at the forefront of trying to change U.S. policy towards Africa, which is a genocidal policy, which is a ruthless policy. 
which is wicked policy. You talk, you talk all over, but you're not part of that fight, not in the trenches like you're supposed to be. Don't talk about um the history if you're not part of the African historic, cultural and historical reclamation movement. Don't talk about the force of hip hop if you're not involved in working with the artists to show them a better way. Don't talk about the flaws of the church if you don't work with the churches that are doing work out here that nobody can question and nobody can challenge. Whatever, don't talk about the fraternities and sororities and deny the work that they do that is in the people's benefit. And just because you don't know anything about it, you may want to dismiss it. Let us promote the labor. Let us promote the labor. Let us share the labor. Let us get involved in the labor. That only happens when everybody gets organized because organizing our people is not an option. It is an obligation. Let, let me Thank ask you, you this, as we, again, as we come, come to a close. What, what are you? Are you a scholar, a historian? What, what are you? I'm an organizer. But by skill, I'm an African history teacher. I'm not a master teacher because no, I, I don't believe teaching could be mastered. I teach three African history classes to children every Saturday. And for people who want to learn more about those, um, I'll send you our contact information. We teach children in Canada virtually. We teach children all over the country virtually. And we're even plugged into the Congo and Kenya and what have you. But um, so I'm a teacher. I'm a children's playwright. I'm a journalist. But at the end of the day, I'm a frontline organizer. I'm never going to be a master journalist. I can learn something new every day. I'm never going to be a master playwright. I can learn something new every day, even though I've written 30 plays in 14 years, all of which have been performed. Our plays mm. have been performed in North America, in Haiti, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and in Burkina Faso with children. They're children's plays. So I no, no, no. It. So every every contribution we make, we're always looking to enhance our skills for the purpose of benefiting the community because we owe our skills and our talents to the masses of our people. Let me ask you this, how, how can some people, uh, they, they, can they, uh, have you written a book? Can people get behind you? Uh, can people yeah, help you um, in some the way? Book, the, book, the, the book that we have out now, and um, I had a copy, man, I just say get it to you, but um, the book that people can Do you read, have it, you can uh, show it to us now? Black, Black Classic Press, shout out to Black Classic Press, and the legendary Paul Coates, who is the father of the world-renowned author Tanasi Coates. Um, he republished my dad's book about the Black Power Movement and Black Panther Party in London called Destroy This Temple, originally published in 1971, but republished two years ago. And I had the honor of writing the introduction to the new book. So people oh, okay. can get an idea. And we will send you information so people can, if they've got children, they want to put in our history classes. Now, what's the name of the book again? The company. And we have a couple of campaigns. Um, I'm the external relations officer to the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association. Right now, we have a campaign called the Asada Shakur Cuba Defense Campaign to get Sister Asada Shakur, the great um, Black Liberation Army leader, the great Panther sister to get her off the FBI's terrorist list, to get the $2 million bounty off her head, and to get Cuba off the State Department's list of nations they accuse of terrorism. We're involved in a campaign to deal with um, Israel's crimes against Africa. So all the crimes that Israel has committed against the African continent, the fact that dozens of police departments in the United States have gone to Israel to be trained by the Israeli Defense Forces. We need to have a sit down with um, our mayors about that because mayors have the same relationship to police that presidents have to, commanders and chiefs have to their militaries. Right. This is serious. We want our hip hop artists and our entertainers who have this lavish jewelry or a taste or craving for lavish jewelry to go back and take their jewelry to the appraiser to see if that came through Israel. And if it did, they need to go and give it back to them to get their money back. And we have something very special coming up on June 8th, which will be a sit down between Africans in DC, Africans in LA, Africans in Nicaragua, Africans in Colombia, Africans in Honduras, 
Africans in Venezuela, Africans in Haiti, Africans in Mexico, so our people can finally see the full impact of the drug and gun cartels on African people in the Western Hemisphere. I love it. So we'll do you have a website? About that. Do, do you that? have a website? Um, people, I... what people can go to, we're, we're in the process of re, um, reorganizing it, but people can find me. The Instagram is at O-B-I-E-G-B-U-N-A-1-5. All right. At J R E G B U N A is the X, formerly Twitter. And for the uh, social media dinosaurs like myself, the email address is O B I E G B U N A 1 5 at gmail.com. So right. they can get involved. So if okay. people want children in those history classes and the theater company, they can do that. But if in your respective areas, if they're children's artistic uh, vehicles, if you have a theater company, we would love to partner with you because we do virtual events all the time and we can collaborate with you so we can bring attention to your courageous and selfless efforts and you can become um, knowledgeable about our efforts. Because one of all the right. other things as we close, we cannot let the challenges and problems we face contribute to apathy and despair. Too many times people promote this narrative of victimization and it paints this picture that nothing is being done. There are recreation centers out here that our children are involved in. There are sports programs our children are involved in. There are thousands of children that are in the public libraries every day. There are thousands of children in martial arts go. programs, dance programs, all type of programs. But instead of promoting that, we focus on who's getting robbed who's getting carjacked, who's right, getting right. shot. Right. How do you think we're right. going to reverse that trend unless you bring attention to the people who have vehicles at our disposal that can turn a negative into a positive? That's right. I love it. It doesn't make any sense, and we need to stop that. All right. Let me ask you this. This is kind of, uh, well, I mean, one of the two that You're proud of yourself, aren't you, for, for, for where you've come to, to carry the mantle? Um, I'm... I'm confident in my people man and i'm just blessed that i've embraced the tradition of resistance which has seen so many people at their best and i i don't like when people call me exceptional or call me an anomaly because i believe that the most significant aspect of the decolonization process brother anthony is to make the exception the norm and the norm the exception i love it our history of struggle is some very illustrious stories, but those people were exceptions. Booker T. Washington was the exception. He wanted to be the norm. Du Bois was the exception. He wanted to be the norm. Ida B. Wells, Mary McLeod Bethune, Daisy Bates, Josina Marshall, Shout Sally Mugabe, Asada Shakur, they're the exceptions. They want to be the norm. We must make the exceptions the norm. I we got need you. thousands of them, millions of them, if we're going to win liberation and maintain liberation. And I since that's the goal, we must settle for nothing else. And what that would require is we transform the island of Black excellence into a training ground of African resistance. And then we bring out the best in everyone. I got you. And hey, everybody. Serving the people. Nothing better than serving the people. Hey, so everybody. This, this is what we do with Strong Inspirations. I try to ask yeah. a few intelligent questions and my man get to rolling on us, don't he? He get to telling it. And and, and brother, I tell you, anytime you want to come on here, because I know we didn't cover all that you might have to express. You, It's an open door policy. I appreciate that, brother Anthony. Just, Thank you so much. And everybody hit the subscribe button on Strong Inspirations where we intoxicate your mind, not DUI, but close to it with people like this gentleman that come on here and knock you out with this knowledge. So and he you, was brother. deemed this way. He was destined for this and he accepted the mantle. He grew up under this tutelage of a close parent, dad, mom, and he took it and did not sway, I'm sure. Probably got all A's. You got all A's in school. I know no, at least in oh, history, hell, didn't no, you? No, man, I almost dropped out of school, brother. I, I was caught up, man. 
I was negatively influenced. I almost lost my life at 15. And yeah. then when that happened, I began to reflect back on all the things I've been blessed to be exposed to. Okay, God I stepped in. I was vulnerable to the same culture of genocide, the same pop culture. The thing that saved my life was the movement or re-properly directed my life was the movement, the struggle. And this is why we know the movement can save anyone. It saved Malcolm X. It saved George Jackson. And it saved everybody that was in it because when you get into it, your life is consumed by selflessness, not selfishness. There so you go. One selflessness, one selflessness. What did Dr. King say? Life's most urgent and persistent question is what are you doing for others? So we tell the children, don't give back. Give first, give foremost, give always. So even if you don't achieve your individual dreams, the people still get your con the best contributions from you on this front line. That's what we have to promote. Everybody must serve. Everybody must give. And we'll get the best that everyone has to offer. This is all we're trying to do. Yeah, so I love it. Else. So even though my dad was intensely involved, and the movement is the only thing in my life that I ever have not did consistently. Remember, I lived on three continents by the time I was 10 years old. I was used to schools, changing neighborhoods, and I didn't realize how that affected me. Nothing could keep my concentration growing up, nothing. I played musical instruments in a children's orchestra, got tired of doing that. I was in a children's theater program, got tired of doing that. I wanted to box, got tired of doing that. Wanted to play basketball, got tired of doing that. I started to think something was wrong with me. I could not, nothing could maintain my attention. The movement is the only thing in my life that has ever maintained my attention. And I'm 34 years into it. I love it. Everybody, that's the final word to you, my brother. Uh, I say this, and I mean this with all sincerity. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind, Thank stay you. in the movement. Because yes. we, we follow you on the upswing. There's something bigger happening for you. Watch. Thank it, you. And, and I hope that this show and this program and you being on here will just expose you that much more because you got a lot to say very eloquently. We, I appreciate it. Everybody, uh, go to my website, businessintheblack.net. I'm going to put more information in the description you about up, this young you man. Keep up, and you keep up the great work you're doing also. Take I'm, I'm going to do it because I, I, people like you, and I, I'm a better person as a result of that. And Thank you, uh, sir. And, and, and with that, I'll say bye-bye. Uh, we out. Peace. Okay, have a good day. You Thank too. You.